Hello and welcome to The Shipping Pod. I am your host, Tim Dooner, here today with uh, a trip in the Wayback Machine. That's right, folks. All great things have an origin story. Be it Peter Parker being bit by a radioactive spider, Bruce Wayne seeing his family gunned down in an alley, or Clark Kent falling to Earth from Krypton. The shipping container has an origin story, too. And we've talked about a number of different topics on the show. But we've never talked about where the actual shipping container came from and how it came to be. Well, it's episode 15, and it's high time that we get to it. So today's episode is going to deal with, you got it, the origin story, the beginnings of the shipping container. If you enjoy today's episode, you can give back to the show in one of two ways. You could rate and review the show on iTunes, or you could visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash the shipping pod. Patreon is a site that allows you, the listener, to support to the show if you do so choose. There's a number of perks involved. Go to the website. All the details are there. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the shipping pod, patreon.com slash the shipping pod. How was your week? It's probably better than the Bruins, right? Not an amazing game out of them. Well, an amazing game out of Tuka Rask, but in overtime... And over time, they left him out there naked, kind of hung him out to dry. He had a masterful performance, but the game ended for an overtime game on a bit of an anticlimactic note. Not much more to say about it. The Bruins just did not have it this year. Ottawa, you had a great team. Best of luck to you moving forward. Love the logo. Love the jerseys. Love Ottawa. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang my hat on you guys for the rest of the way. Hey, I mentioned a couple episodes ago, well, a few weeks ago, that I'd started using that MyFitnessPal app, and it's been great. I've lost eight pounds using it. It's, um, you know, it's a bit of a grind, calorie counting everything, scanning barcodes, figuring out portion sizes and all that, but it does work, and I'm using it in collusion with the 5x5 weightlifting program, and the 5x5 weightlifting program, if you're not familiar, is deadlifts, rows, squats. It's all squats. I mean, you were, you're squatting like a sumo wrestler. You're just, you're up and down nonstop. Every workout starts with squats. It doesn't end with squats, but every workout starts with the squats. Gives you, gives you a, <laughs> a great leg workout. Gives you jelly legs. I got, I, I powered through that after the first couple weeks. And, uh, I don't know. It's going good now. I really, I highly recommend that my fitness pal app. It works wonders, at least for me, especially with summer coming up, right? I got my son these Tom and Jerry DVDs. So I was looking for a cartoon to get my son into. He's really into Ninja Turtles, the 80s one. I played those from, they have have like almost all of them on YouTube. And I thought they would have the same with another one of my favorite cartoons when I was a kid, Tom and Jerry. And uh, I mean, they do. They have some of them on YouTube, but it's it's really hit or miss. You know, they have some of the old ones, but then they have the new ones mixed in there. Not a fan of the art style of the new one. So I thought, okay, I'll go on Amazon. I'll get him a DVD with a classic collection. So I get the DVD and I, I put it on. And um, I <laughs> I don't know if history erases things or I just hadn't watched a ton of Fred Quimby, Tom and Jerry episodes. But Jerry is absolutely sadistic. I mean, he's scalping Tom. He's hitting him with an axe. Itchy and scratchy is barely an exaggeration of what's going on in the Fred Quimby world of Tom and Jerry. And these are unedited, so I had to I had to skip a couple because um there's some real off color race humor in these old cartoons. I'm kind of surprised that Warner Brothers actually hadn't removed this content. And I I I guess that's fine. You don't want to whitewash history. It's something that did that did happen. For example, Jerry in a scene is trying to disguise himself from Tom. So he puts shoe polish on his face. And starts pantomiming like a like a minstrel play. 
<laughs> it's like, oh, ma, yeah, I don't want, I don't want that normalized <laughs> in, in my son's life. You're next on the on the DVD button, but for the most part, I love, love, love these old Tom and Jerry's. I love the old music that they use. They had Tom playing a cello outside this girl's this girl's house, this girl cat that he wants to press, and he's he's singing, you know, Louis Jordan's Is you, is you, is you not my baby. Is you ain't my baby. It's just it, oh, it's fantastic stuff. And uh I just love the ambience and this and the the sound. They don't make cartoons like that anymore. And, you know, as just mentioned, in some aspects for good reasons, but yeah, I, I think I just have to skip the Quimby ones because those um those just those take the violence. It's like Saw, you know, like Eli Roth wishes he could write the Tom and Jerry like Fred Quimby. I mean, I swear to God. It's kind of it for me. The the week the week flew by. I feel like I just recorded last week's show. And here I am again, right in front of the microphone, ready to go with a new episode. This one, we have a lot to cover. So no news short on the uh, short on the stories short on the banter. Let's get right to it. As mentioned at the top of the show, today's topic is the origin story of the box. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? And as we know, the, the ubiquitous shipping container, you see the 40s, you see the 20s on the water. The box is responsible for the shirt on your back, the microphone I'm speaking into, the smartphone you're listening to this on, the growth of logistics industry, and globalization as a whole. But... Seafaring did not start with standardized containers, we know today. No, for centuries, mankind sailed the oceans blue, not just on voyages of discovery, but on missions of plunder and trade. Egyptians, Vikings, Romans, the French, British, and even the good old U.S. of A. always needed ways to bring goods to or take them away from one destination to another. And for centuries, leading all the way up to the 20th century, those goods would be what is now considered break bulk. Break bulk is just loose, non-shipping containerized cargo. Before the shipping container existed, commodities would be loaded in sacks, chests, bales, crates, barrels, and nets, placed in the hold wherever they could fit on board without the ship sinking. These shipments would be hand-loaded at port, at first by the ship's crew themselves or by whatever slaves they may have brought or captured, until eventually ports began staffing longshoremen. As many as two dozen men would be tasked with the arduous process of sorting, stacking, and loading each individual crate one by one. Not only was this incredibly labor-intensive and slow, but numerous issues would occur. Pilfering. Goods would end up on the wrong ship or lost. Loose goods would fall or be thrown overboard. Crates rotted from the seawater. Items crushed or otherwise damaged. The problem further exacerbated as trade lanes grew. The more cargo there was the longer the load times and the more opportunity for error, especially since there were no standards for markings. If your shipment was lucky enough to make it on board the correct vessel and survive the voyage, there was still plenty of opportunity for a dockhand at destination to damage the cargo, steal it, or misload it on the wrong coach, carriage, rail, or truck. So, due to all of these pratfalls, costs, time, and uncertainty of delivery, international trade's growth was naturally stunted. Until, as far back as 1766, an Englishman by the name of James Brindley needed a more reliable and standardized way of shipping coal, so he designed a box boat named the Starvationer. The Starvationer could be loaded with 10 wooden boxes and used to carry his coal from the quarry to Manchester via the Bridgewater Canal. Then... Throughout the 1800s, a wide variety of containers were designed and put to use. Those of wood and iron, their designs tailored to fit the capabilities of local transportation. As rail cars grew to prominence, a wide variety of boxes were developed for their cars, but standardization was still a century away. In May of 1917, Benjamin Franklin Fitch developed the first widespread container system in the U.S. While history remembers Malcolm McLean as the grandfather of containerization, It was Fitch, who was truly the great-grandfather of container transport systems. Could you imagine being Benjamin Franklin Fitch at the time? You've got a lot to live up to. And, uh, you know, like, oh, Benjamin Franklin's coming by for a business deal. Oh, no, no, it's Benjamin Franklin Fitch. (laughs) You know, wrong, wrong one. It's, uh, it's like, uh, (laughs) remember Ann Nicole Smith's lawyer, Howard K. Stern? It's like, no, no, it's not Howard, it's Howard K. Stern. Or an office space, you had Michael Bolton. Hey, Fitchy! Fly kite, Fitchy! 
But you know what? Live up to his name he did, with the design of a container known as demountable bodies. Those were a standardized container system that consisted of one 5-ton motor truck chassis, nine removable truck bodies, 12 sets of lifting chain hoists, and five overhead superstations. His system debuted to great success at the Cincinnati Railroad Terminals, and thus the blueprint for standardized containers and automation was written. I bet him Franklin does a great job. Gotta get him back on the site. His system was such a success that it was extended to 21 railway stations and 14 freight trucks capable of handling 225 container loads. Fitch went on to design a number of other container ideas, including a 20-foot steel box that strongly resembles the 20s we use today. Fitch got a number of government contracts. He expanded all the way up to the Northeast, many other railways importing his system over to them, and, and his, his lifting chain hoists were the precursor of sorts to the gantry cranes that we see today at modern terminals. However, the Great Depression hit, Government contracts went away, his focus turned to developing the U.S. highways, and his container ideas failed to reach widespread proliferation. Fitch wouldn't go away without leaving a lasting impression, though. In November 1932, in Enola, the first container terminal in the world was opened by Pennsylvania Railroad Company, which used the Fitch hooking system for reloading containers. In 1933 in Europe, under the auspices of the International Chamber of Commerce, the International Container Bureau was established. This was where the first parameters for containers used in international traffic were set forth. Things stayed this way for a while. <laughs> as, it, as you can see, the development of containers was really slow moving. You know, we're, we're talking about <laughs> centuries and thousands of years of humanity. Near millennia of time. Where, for the, for the, it, was, it was just break bull cargo, it was put out loose, and when container shipments were designed... There was no standard, there was no communication, but it was coming. And in 1952, the U.S. Army developed a precursor to the modern shipping container with a Connex box system, which consisted of modular standardized steel boxes that were roughly 6 feet long, 4 feet wide, and 6 feet 10 inches high. The Connex boxes could be stacked 3 high and protected their contents from the elements. By 1965, the U.S. military had used over 100,000 Connex boxes, making them the first worldwide use of intermodal containers. But the world of shipping was still a disjointed place, and standardization needed to go global for international trade to prosper. You know, and, and in order for that to happen, a bevy of industries needed to align. Trains, trucks, terminals, and ships would have to agree upon a standard. And this was the mid-1900s. There was no Slack, there was no Skype, there was no go-to meeting for coordinating, no Google Docs where everyone could get together in the cloud or virtually or really even in person to come together with all these industries to, 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 to settle on one format that we were going to go with and really launch globalization into the stratosphere. What we were seeing up until this time is you had the wooden boxes and you had the iron boxes, many of which didn't even have tops. That's, that's what made the Connex system unique. It could finally protect the goods inside and out. And the military loved it because they could start, they could start using it for, for transports. They could put trucks in there. They could put gear in there. They could stack whatever they wanted without risk of having it damaged, misplaced. They could mark it. They would know exactly where it's going. It made engaging in war a much more systematic and logistically manageable process. And, we, you know, we think now we're, we're pampered with our, with our tracking and <laughs> we're, we're with our tracking and all that and, and blockchain solutions are coming out and, and this, that, and the other thing. But way back when, you never knew if your shipment was going to get there or not. And due to that, it really made trade not a viable option. You can't run a business when you don't know if cargo is going to show up or when it's going to show up or if it's going to end up in, you know, the Bahamas or if it's going to end up in the port of Miami when you need it in Philadelphia because it was loaded onto the wrong ship because the markings weren't just weren't there. That brings us to a gentleman that I mentioned a little bit earlier, Malcolm McLean. Malcolm McLean is in the Maritime Hall of Fame 
and was named Man of the Century. Malcolm McLean came from humble beginnings. He ran a trucking company and was frustrated by the amount of time it took to load and unload trucks. Hours wasted, dollars lost, again, cargo damaged, misplaced, or stolen. Compounding that was McLean's need to scale his operation, which had grown from one secondhand truck in 1937 to 1,750 trucks in 1950. But mo money, mo problems. With such a huge fleet, McLean was getting eaten alive by road restrictions on weight and fees for overages. So McLean, like many a man before him seeking opportunity, looked to the seas. He reasoned, what if we could standardize a container, then load them on a ship by the hundreds and sell the goods to strategically placed trucking hubs, thereby avoiding the expensive fines he faced via interstate trucking? So McLean made a bold move. In 1955, he sold his trucking business. He then took out a loan for $45 million, and this is in 1955 money. And mind you, he had a very successful trucking company. He was just frustrated by the tax man. He was just frustrated by the road restrictions. And this was a time before there were the highway system we have now wasn't realized just yet. It was it was still being built. It was still proliferating across the United States. He had a better idea. He took this huge risk. He had his loan of forty five million and he purchased the Pan Atlantic Steamship Company. His interest in the Pan Atlantic Steamship Company was that they already had docking rights at most of the ports he was targeting. So, upon buying them, he summarily rechristened the company to Sea Land Industries. From here, he moved on to the next phase of his plan, and that was to design a primitive version of the modern shipping container. His demands were for a strong, standardized, stackable, lockable, and loadable steel box. He wanted this box to answer all of the criticisms of moving trade via sea which were, again, there there were no markings on the boxes, theft, many of the boxes weren't even covered, things would get destroyed, they would end up in the wrong place, pilferage, as we mentioned. So the the goal there was to to eradicate all of that and answer it with one perfectly refined solution. But he wasn't done yet. His next play was to design a ship that could actually carry his containers. Building this business out of whole cloth, he, (laughs) on his own, had to take many of these ideas from his forebearers, like Mr. Benjamin Franklin Fitch. You know, a lot like Steve Jobs. He he took a number of ideas, brought them together, refined them, and put them in a palatable package that the average shipper could understand and get behind. And to execute that, he purchased an oil tanker and modified it. The Ideal X was retrofitted to hold 58 of his standardized containers as well as 20,000 tons of oil. It made its maiden voyage on April 26, 1956, sailing from New Jersey to Houston. McLean had some sales chops, too. He immediately began selling space for the return voyage before the Ideal X even docked in Houston. And he was able to do this in a few ways, but one of them was offering a 25% discount versus conventional freight, plus a surety against theft with the locking system, and like that, his new venture was already a success. From there, his company expanded, adding the ship Gateway City in 1957, which sailed from New Jersey to Miami. But growth hit a wall because his containers could only go on the ships that he had modified for them. As there was no standardization yet, he was still locked in his own ecosystem. There was another play he'd have to make. A crucial step in his container system being adapted globally was that he released the patent to his container's corner posts. This particular design was vital to the strength of the containers, their stackability, and the foundation for the modern corner point locking systems. And these corner point locking systems are how you can stack containers 5, 10, 15 high on one of these large vessels without, <laughs> without the ship completely listing or the containers falling off to sea. As we, uh, as we talked about shipwrecks and some containers that were lost at sea, 
it's not a, it, it rarely happens. You know, most of the containers that happen, it, the entire ship has to go down for there really to be a dent in the numbers of containers moved annually for that to be a huge, huge issue. He released the patent. Companies started seeing the value in his container system. It was quickly adopted, but for the first 20 years of container shipping, things were still a mess. Sealand used 35-foot boxes, while rival company Matson Navigation had its own fleet of 24-foot containers. Beyond them, numerous other companies had their own ideas. There was the development of the 10, the 20, the 40, which are the standards we know now, but not at the time. Until, finally, from 1968 to 1970, the International Organization for Standardization, known as ISO, established four important standards that outlined markings, corner fittings, terminology, and most importantly, minimum and maximum size dimensions for containers. And a bit of trivia here, NYK takes the prize as the first TEU carrier that adhered to those standards when they began sailing a vessel with 752 TEU capacity in 1968. And uh, for some terminology, if you listen to episode 5, Shipping Terms of Endearment, you would know what a TEU is. Or if you're in this industry and deal with freight, you would also be very familiar with a TEU. It's a term used today. If you'd like to know more, go back and listen to episode 5. But a TEU is a 20 equivalent unit. And what that refers to is a 20-foot container. There's also FEU, which is which is 40 equivalent unit, which refers to a 40-foot container, which is the other standard. The modern ocean container lengths are you got your 20 foot, 40 foot, 40 HQ, and your 45 foot. 20s and 40s are 8 feet wide by 8 feet high. And of course, 20 feet long or 40 feet long. The HQ, I believe they're what, nine, nine and a half feet tall? Yeah, I think that's right. You may ask too, where did they come up with eight feet high? Well, they didn't pull it out of the blue. It was to accommodate railway tunnels. We've come this far, and you may be wondering, Tim. Are you finally going to tell us how this box changed the world? Sure. And it did. Despite predictions otherwise. Initially, economists looked at what McLean was doing, shipping up and down the coast, and took it at face value. They thought interstate trade would increase. Clothing from the garment district in New York going down to North Carolina, cotton coming back up from the south, so on and so forth, they did not predict that it would be cheaper for a department store in Manhattan to buy a blouse from China than from the tailors and seamstresses on 42nd Street. That's that's pretty mind-blowing, too. A, I mean, a global economy didn't exist yet. And it, it's not intuitive to, <laughs> to think, as you look at all the groundwork that went into this and, and how long it took for standardization to even come up with and how much of a hassle importing and exporting was at the time, the idea of doing it with clothing What? And the idea of doing it with with most general freight, you know, you might bring farm animals, you might bring oriental rugs, spices, commodities that can't necessarily be found in the U.S., but things we could manufacture here? You're going to bring those over from China and somehow it's going to be cheaper? So you can't necessarily blame them for not foreseeing what was to come, the sea change that was on the horizon. And the changes came rapidly. As more steamships hit the water, Their capacity grew, and ports changed drastically. While some declined, others that were less developed could be redesigned to service larger ships. For example, Oakland replaced the docks in San Francisco, Newark over Manhattan, London and Liverpool declined, while Felixstowe and Rotterdam in the Netherlands rose to prominence. Another byproduct was the number of longshoremen jobs were greatly reduced, which caused a massive strike in the 70s. As we mentioned before, with the brake bolt cargo, it would take, you know, two dozen men to load a boat. Could take hours, maybe more. Could take days to get a 100,000 loose pieces of cargo all in boxes, crates, sacks, bales, what have you. No methodology to putting the boxes in there. There wasn't the Tetris game that we have now where we stack containers down to a science, one on top of the other. You have a 20, you have a 40, you know how they're going to fit. Can, goods could have been anything. You know, the manifest, the manifest didn't consider size that much. But now, since nothing had to be loaded, except for the containers themselves, on the gantry cranes or the, the harbor hooks, 
the longshoremen were suddenly on the outs. And one of the only ways that the strikes throughout the 70s were resolved were so much money was saved on shipping and so much money was made that they were able to give out pensions and pay off a lot of these longshoremen to walk away from the job, put down the picket signs and retain a a much, much smaller crew. But it's not a zero sum game. Those jobs just weren't lost forever and no other jobs arrived. They were replaced by truckers, warehouse workers, customs agents, freight forwarders, and customs brokers. I may not be alone, but (laughs) if you work in this industry, and I'm sure many of you who listen to this podcast do, when the argument about made in America or globalization is brought up, job loss is often cited and our industry is largely ignored as an employer. Nobody thinks about the entry specialist or the customs broker or the drawback specialist or even the brake bulk specialist because we still do have brake bulk. If things are out of gauge, they don't fit within a container. Those things still exist, just not nearly by and large as they do now. You know, 95% of goods moving across the water are going to be in a your 20, your 40, your 40 high Q, your 45 and even reefers. Calm down, Ricky Williams. Uh, Reefers. That refers to a refrigerated cargo container used for frozen goods, perishables, things that need to be kept cold, climate controlled. To be fair, it wasn't just the longshoremen who were largely out of work. It wouldn't be long before the manufacturing and factory sectors of the U.S. quickly shut down as the global market made operating costs unsustainable. Suddenly you could get that blouse here (laughs) for a lot cheaper in materials and the landed cost would be 2.5 cents in ocean freight. And that cost competitiveness. Lower cost goods meant access to a much greater variety of goods available to all. But part of opening that global market means that prices came down for the U.S. consumers. I mean, let's face it, shipping cargo is dirt cheap. You know, a container to the East Coast from Shanghai averages, what, $1,200? Under 1000 to the West Coast? And we go back to that economist who just thought that boats were going to go up and down the ports and trade would be interstate, not global. Trade would be Baltimore to Miami. Because in 1966, 1% of all countries had container ports. But in less than 20 years, that number rose to 90%. So we're talking 1983, 90% of countries had container ports now. That is a ton of Options, sourcing, and variety. And many of those options do come from China. China controls uh, 26% of global trade for the entire world. It's It's a large slice of the pie, guys. And to put that into perspective to how far we've come, the U.S. receives nearly $2 trillion worth of goods per year in imports. (laughs) <laughs> One thing we've talked numerous times on here is is trade deficits, because we definitely are not exporting $2 trillion worth of goods from the United States. We do our fair share, but, you know, part of, part of the benefit, if you're going to deal with a world that's set up in globalization as ours rapidly was, as it rapidly changed from 1970 till now, is part of that deficit means... The United States gets goods produced by what would otherwise be cheap labor brought to our shores. And those lower costs mean lower costs to the end consumer. Again, we hear the argument all the time about made in America. But on every study they've done, when you start looking at onshoring or the cost of a pair of jeans, for example, like a company like Levi's, a great company, and they they offer their made in America and their made in in Asia jeans. And the price difference is well over $100 between the two. And which one do they sell in much greater volume? Well, it's the 501s. They're selling the $50 and $60 jean. They're not selling the $220 American-made jean nearly as often. And there's a reason why. Money creates access and lower costs create more access. So you see the sacrifice in manufacturing, but the end result is, well, now you get some dungarees. And let's look at some numbers. There are more than 17 million shipping containers in the world 
which make over 200 million trips per year. Pretty mind-blowing when you think of it, right? I mean, a sweater can travel 3,000 miles for two and a half cents. There's over 6,000 container vessels currently in service, and they are getting huge. From the Ideal X, which held, what, 58 containers during its maiden voyage, to NYK's first ISO-standardized TEU voyage, which carried 752 TEUs, to the just-delivered Mole Triumph, the largest steamship in the world. It carries a gargantuan 20,170 TEUs. This ship is nearly twice as long as the Titanic. And I know when people talk about ships, they, they, they mention the Titanic, and I, and as I'm saying this, I'm realizing how ridiculous it is, because who among us has seen the Titanic to really, to really visualize that? So let me put it into, let me put it into terms that actually make some sense or that you can visualize. This ship, how about, how about this one? The Mole Triumph is more than three and a half football fields long, and that's including the end zones. So you get, what, 360 yards there, then you get another half. You know, for the fans to sit, put the Gatorade, that's how big this thing is. I mean, that's enormous. Most ports can't even receive that ship. Boston, for example, just recently received its first, what, 8,000 TEU ship. And that, that was a feat of engineering. So to Boston, we're definitely not going to see the Mole Triumph over here, but it, it does go through the Strait of Malacca. And the Strait of Malacca is the busiest ocean lane in the world. The Strait of Malacca basically dictates how big these ships can be made, but each time they they, they make one of these, and the new, these, these new mega class, these monoliths, these, this 20,000 TU class, which is, which there's a number of them. MOL, I believe CMA, they, they have a couple on the water right now. And it's interesting to me how we, we hear all these issues about capacity and taking boats out of service. And well, I imagine a 20,000 TU vessel could take some boats out of, out of service, but does this help capacity? Does it take away from, you know, does it solve the issue? I'd imagine you'd have to decommission boats to really see the benefit. And when you think about a ship that large, I wonder what kind of mileage it gets, you know? Because, like, my father-in-law, he has, like, a 14-foot boat. It's, it's got one motor, an inboard motor, and that thing, that thing eats gas like crazy. <laughs> you pour a tank in there, you take a couple of loops around the lake, and, uh, you know, there's uh, $25, there's $40 gone. I don't, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what the mileage would be on one of these. I'm going to look that up. Get back to you guys on the mileage of the Mole Triumph. Like, mile per gallon? Could it even be? Could it be less? Although I did read that the Triumph does have some renew, it, it uses some renewable energy. And I don't know if that's the power of the inside or, or what exactly is going on there, but there is a little bit of a green footprint. I mean, it's hard, it's hard not to leave a gigantic footprint when you have a boat that is that large. However, if you have a boat that that's that is that large, but it's more efficient than smaller vessels, eh, then you know maybe the end game is a smaller footprint. Containers aren't just for shipping anymore, though. They're used as structures for homes, offices, restaurants, portable pop-up stores, and even pools. I was just reading an article that it's well, it's a little bit old now. It has to do with Starbucks. It's not the unicorn frappuccino. Did you guys have that? I didn't. I'm not a big sugar guy. I um, I don't know. I I never drink my calories, and I never have. I've never been into like cokes or or those heavy drinks. I'm a venti black iced at Starbucks. No unicorn. It <laughs> it looked interesting. Uh, it looked uh looked like the Galaxy Foam sneakers, and I could see why tons of young girls were <laughs> were all over these things, and the Instagram feed was just blowing up with the unicorn frappuccino, and it's gone already. It was uh, limited time, and I heard many barista is are happy to see the unicorn go. Apparently, not the easiest drink to make. But either way, I was reading an article up about sustainable store design in action, and it had to do with Starbucks Reclamation drive through and I'm going to murder this name, but it's, it's Tuckwilla? Tuckwilla, Washington? Tuckwilla? I'm not sure. Can somebody in Washington please correct me? It wouldn't be an episode of the Shipping Pod without me mispronouncing something. Right, Joaquin? This small project, though, 
I'm just I'm looking at it really quick, and I, I'm sorry to kind of read it on the the air, but I, I it, it just dawned on me. I thought it was interesting. It was it was a lead certified store. The store was located across from the port, and one of the directors at Starbucks got inspired by seeing all these shipping containers there, especially the abandoned ones, and they wanted to do something with the shipping containers that had been taken out of service. So their project was Reclamation drive through and they made a Starbucks completely out of shipping containers. Now, Starbucks isn't the first place to do that. There are a ton of different stores that are built out of shipping containers now. It's they're, They've become in fashion. It's, uh, again, it's kind of piggybacking on that tiny house nation, smaller footprint, there's uh there's some great advantages in terms of with like pop up stores you can you can close up the shipping container pop it on a on a chassis move it from wherever you need it to go in terms of housing um I don't know do you ever watch the show Grand Designs it's on Netflix and they made this in Ireland this guy made this great house out of he took um two forty fives and he didn't stack them well he put them on top of each other but he cross barred them and the way a shipping container is designed is they can go end over end, top over top, but they can't go. They can't go across each other. They're they're not built that way. So he had to build a special iron brace to lay it on top. Either way, I mean the house ended up looking really cool. But there's obviously some things that I mean you don't get a basement with them. I mean I guess you could you could put another ship container over to the side as your as your shed or your basement or your storage. I wonder. Um, I don't know. Do those things rust. Would they rust after a couple of years? The ones that are on the water. And I understand they're in seawater all the time, but you know the elements for New England winter can't be that much different, especially if you're close to uh, close to the harbor over here. But I mean, they're all rusted and they're all beat to hell. So I don't know. But either way, you know, the Starbucks restaurant looks it looks wicked cool. I would like to stop by it sometime. And uh, hey, I've seen some bungalows that look really cool. You take like a forty, cut open the front, use it as a uh, as a patio, put your cabana out there, put a hammock up. I can see Ryan Dooley sitting in one of those with a pina colada. Sending me a postcard. What do you say, Ryan? Anyways, I'm just rambling. But that store, sustainable drive through awesome stuff. And, uh, you know, the shipping container. A simple box in all her minimalistic glory looks poised to remain a constant sight on the seas and ports of America and recycled and repurposed throughout the cities and towns the world over. An enduring image of trade whose story has only just begun. And uh, that's it for now on shipping containers. We can, we'll dive deeper into some of these other things, um, especially the the other uses for shipping containers, which absolutely intrigues me. I want to get a couple of guests on here who can, who develop and build houses out of them. I'll be revealing some names soon when that episode comes up, but I'm excited. And this one, I kind of wanted to put out as a foundation. And as I mentioned, it's episode 15. Our logo is a shipping container. We talk about shipping containers all of the time, but we never really talked about where it came from, how it came to be. How did it come to be put in use? It seems like such a logical and simple thing, but as we learned, it took millennia before people uh, before people got on board with this. You know, it wasn't until the mid 20th century that these were even put in use. It wasn't until almost 1970 that standardization happened. I mean, think about that. The Beatles. The Beatles ran through their entire career. The Beatles broke up. I mean, the Beatles, they broke up before the shipping container was even standardized or just as standardization was coming into effect. Just as that NYK ship made her first voyage with those 752 TEUs. Ah, amazing stuff. Well, kids, that is it for me. If you want to correct my pronunciation of the names of towns in Washington, you can do so at info at theshippingpod.com. Visit our website, theshippingpod.com. We have all of our old episodes here. As I mentioned, this is episode 15. You can hear this one and the other 14 over there, or you can do so on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud. Although SoundCloud, we only have the two most current on there because SoundCloud has some, I don't know, some weird rules. I already pay one host. I'm not going to pay SoundCloud as well. Uh, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Overcast, however you want it. We're there. Instagram, Instagram.com slash the shipping pod. Love to post pictures on there. I highly recommend checking it out. They're usually related to the episode tomorrow or whenever. By the time you're listening to this, I'll have some pictures up about uh, that show the blueprints of Benjamin Franklin Fitch. 
his original design for the 20 foot container. And you can see how much of a blueprint that served to be. I also have a few of his other schematics. Neat stuff for y'all to nerd out on. Uh, Twitter. Twitter. At the shipping pod. We're on LinkedIn. Facebook. Wherever you need us. Wherever you need us. The shipping pod is there. Think of that jingle. Stick with that one. Um, oh yeah. You want to give back to the show? Please. Rate and review us on iTunes. Really helps. Be great to get listed on the new and notable. Much like the shipping container, help the show proliferate to the masses. I won't be happy until you're hearing this in elevators, in a Muzak form. I wonder what I would sound like in Muzak form. Additionally, there's the Patreon, patreon.com slash the shipping pod. That is P A T R E O N dot com slash the shipping pod. We have a couple of Patreon subscribers. First Patreon is Bailey. Bailey. You great white Maltese falcon, love your support. And I love your sister, Maybelline. She's a great dog. And longtime listener, Jessica Hillier. Jessica Hillier is with LeSaint Logistics. They can design and deliver the right mix of bundled and unbundled services to create a complete, integrated, and effective supply chain system for you. Put LeSaint know how to work for your business and see the difference their knowledge can make. That's LeSaint Logistics. If you want to reach Jessica Hillier... You can do so at J-H-I-L-L-Y-E-R at L-E-S-A-I-N-T dot com. Jay Hillier at LaSaint dot com. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. And that's it for me. This has been Tim Dooner for The Shipping Pod saying so long. I work work in a box store. I stand beside you on most days. Can't stand the things you say If I could fly So high And look down Upon this place I would blow out All the walls And wake up feeling Different each day I work In a box store Things nobody needs. I love the way you look. I just hate the way you look at me. If I could fly so high and look down upon this place, I would kill all the chatter and wake up feeling different each day.